All right, thank you for coming for our session. Um, we welcome you, but we would appreciate if you would move a little closer to us. Come a little closer. We do not bite, we're friendly folk. So we're having a panel and we're looking at some provocation questions, so it'd be really nice if we can hear you without you having to yell. <laughs> so thank you so much for moving, definitely nice. Yeah. <laughs> no looking at the back, Hugh. <laughs> Thank you. This is great. Thank you so much. Okay. So thank you so much for coming. And our panel is about futures of interdisciplinary open educational resources. My name is Dr. Connie Blomgren, and I am a professor at Athabasca University in our Master's of Education in Open Digital and Distance Education. And to my left is, uh, go ahead, James. Hi, I'm Dr. James Greenwood Lee. I'm a professor at uh, Athabasca University, assistant professor um, in applied mathematics at the Center for Science. Um, and I am Dr. Stella George. I am um, an associate prof in computing and information systems at Athabasca University. And we have one more colleague, um, Trevor, Dr. Trevor Butler, who is in the School of uh, Architecture at Athabasca University. Um, and, and he's going to join us via the telephone today. <laughs> Oops, sorry. It's a, okay. So um, Athabasca University is Canada's online and open university, and we welcome a diversity of learners from all over Canada. And we celebrate and acknowledge Indigenous heritage, including the ancestral lands on which our buildings are located today in Athabasca on Treaty 6 and Treaty 8. It's a, a traditional me territorial meeting ground. And of the Cree and the Métis, and it's been the home for many, well, time immemorial for many Indigenous peoples. We respectfully acknowledge that we live and work on the traditional lands of the Indigenous peoples of the country known as Canada, and we honour the ancestry, heritage, and gifts of Indigenous peoples and give thanks to them. So we're going to be talking about a very interesting project, Interdisciplinary by Nature and by Design. And it was, um, as you can tell, we've got an educator, mathematician, computer scientist, and an architect, uh, engineering architect, or construction engineer. So quite different in our backgrounds. And so um, James is going to have a little bit of the uh, Genesis story about the Callisto funding. Uh, yeah, so I think we'd just start off with uh, an acknowledgement to Callisto. Callisto is a educational outreach program that's um, supported by Cybera and the Pacific Institute of Mathematical Sciences uh, here in Canada. And they focus on educational outreach um, that centers on data science. Um, so I, I'm not going to talk too much about uh, how this all came to be because there is a a bit of a story there, but I, uh, rather I think we want to highlight um, what the project was and um, use it as an example because it'll sort of ground the discussion, the panel discussion later on. So uh, in our case, Callisto funded our project called Form and Function Sustainable Design Meets Computational Thinking. And this was a project that sought to provide educational outreach uh, through the creation of OER. Um, focused on computational thinking and promoting computational thinking at the high school level. Oh, <laughs> yeah, okay. uh, so in approaching this project, we really wanted to be uh, open in the sense of opening it up to the broadest possible audience. So I think one of the dangers when you start thinking about computational thinking is that it gets siloed in very quickly um, into computer science mathematics possibly, and it eliminates 
and creates barriers for a, a large potential audience. And so we really wanted to open up the discussion of what is computational thinking and have that available to a broader audience, which is why we took an interdisciplinary approach. And, and we did so using a STEAM approach and a bit of a sleight of hand um, in, in that we, we took the spotlight off of um, computational thinking and placed it on a related concept, but a concept that felt more universal, and that was on the concept of design. And so the project really became um, about three design inquiries. Uh, the first introduced design as a concept from an architectural and built communities perspective, uh, introducing the idea of sustainable design, the problems that are associated with sustainable design, what sustainable design might look like, and how it might be achieved. Sorry, I'll get dry mouth. <clears throat> Uh, the second design inquiry then pivoted and it took more of a natural sciences perspective and asked, well, what does design look like from a natural sciences perspective? And then the third perspective on, or the third inquiry came back to computational thinking and said, well, what does design look like from a mathematical and computer uh, modeling perspective? So seemingly they're a bit unrelated or totally unrelated, <laughs> um, but we, we found a way to pull them all together. Um, I think how we were able to pull them all together was that underlying the project were these sort of core values um, that really sort of brought the team together. Um, so the first of those values of, is of course openness and in some ways, that goes without saying, we're all faculty at Athabasca University, which is Canada's open university. And so in varying degrees, we all deal in open education on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, but as Connie pointed out, we're all from diverse backgrounds, from different centers. Uh, we've formed this interdisciplinary team. And I think when you work in any team, but in particular uh, interdisciplinary teams, it's important that those teams be collaborative and cooperative and that you be open to sharing your knowledge and your perspectives and equally open to hearing and listening and learning um, from the knowledge of others and their perspectives. So that was important for us. Um, ultimately, I guess the goal of all this openness is empowerment. So we wanted to empower uh, teachers with new materials uh, and a different perspective on computational learning. We wanted to empower students to be able to, to learn this subject matter. Um, but I think one of the things that we really wanted to also seed was a whole systems view. Um, so we wanted to move away from that siloed, really focused um, perspective on, on subject matter. And we wanted to provide something that looked more at a whole system and sort of see that into, uh, into sort of the minds of, of young students. Oh, Did I go too far? Yeah, no, no, you're right. You're okay. Right. Uh, so the next um, few slides actually, and I'll, I'll push through these pretty quickly because one of the products that we produced through this was is a video, an animation that provides the overarching story of the project. Um, and so there's probably better value in, in, in watching that than, than listening to me blab on about these slides. But these slides essentially highlight the process that we went through in, in developing each of the design um, inquiries and tying them together. Um, in fact, I think these were repurposed from one of our early meetings um, as the project kicked off. So uh, just the highlight is that, you know, we. The first one um, focused on sustainable design from that sort of architectural and built communities perspective. Uh, the next one pivoted to the natural sciences perspective. And here we're, you know, our thoughts were that we could not only look at nature uh, for inspiration um, as to what solutions to sustainable design problems might look like, um, but we could also look to nature for um, processes to find those solutions. And in this case, that's natural selection that we fell upon. 
Um, and that provided us with our pivot to our, our final design inquiry, which was mathematical and computer modeling, and basically using natural selection as a process to emulate um, for mathematical and computer modeling. Uh, of course, OER are only useful if they have uh, real practical applications in the classroom. And so a large part of the work that we did uh, was really focused on creating those curriculum connections. Um, and I think this will be part of what we end up discussing later on. Um, so it worked quite well and it was quite, I think there were quite beautiful connections between what we uh, created and the Alberta K our high school curriculum. Um, and in fact, quite rich um, with many connections possible. And I think there's even many more that we haven't even explored. Um, that being said, they're scattered across different courses, right? So uh, high school is taught in a very siloed manner. So it's when you create these materials, you're making connections to a bunch of different courses as opposed to any single course. And that potentially poses problems. Um, so, but we did our best and we put it all together um, and it came together through the work of um, the hard work of a bunch of contributors. So we'd just like to point that out. Um, and the materials are available on OER Commons and through the Callisto website. Um, and I think right now what we'll do is just shift to watching the video and, uh, and then move on from there. Is it going to work? <laughs> okay, he's just working on it there. Uh, just to speak to that, uh, we really were thinking about high school students, primarily in Alberta, but part of the design was to also create it so that it was um, uh, had lots of hooks. So be being OER, making it um, available in different ways for others to build out, sort of like Lego, sometimes what we thought. So enjoy, it's about eight minutes. Computational thinking is much more Design the shape of the building based on its functions and goals. Aesthetics are generally preferred, but beauty also needs functionality. As we seek to lessen our environmental impact in the face of climate change, we must build communities that sustainably integrate into the ecologies they inhabit. Our goal is to design communities that create as much energy as they consume, operate to conserve water, are carbon neutral, and are beautiful. Attaining ecological integration of our built communities is a very complex design problem. How might we solve this? Using ideas from nature. Have you ever wondered how nature is so well designed? We see diversity and variation, animals adapted for where they live. This is due to natural selection. Darwin's finches are a prime example of natural selection. During his ocean voyage as a naturalist, Darwin observed and collected finches while visiting the Galapagos Islands. With the help of ornithologist John Gould, they realized that the Galapagos finches were similar to a type of finch found on mainland South America. This similarity suggested that the Galapagos Islands finches came from the mainland, but they were quite different. Surprisingly, they were also different from island to island. The finch's size, claw size, and beak shape all varied depending on the food sources on each of the islands in the Galapagos. Natural selection favored physical adaptations that fit the environment. For example, longer and narrow beaks were more suitable for eating insects. Short and narrow beaks were suitable for eating nuts and seeds. Returning now to the concept of design. 
buildings, like Darwin's finches, have lots of form and function goals. Natural selection is a process that promotes useful adaptation. If we apply it to our building design problem, the idea may lead to better form and function in our building and community designs. To do so, let's explain how this process works. Natural selection operates on populations. Within populations, individuals vary in trait expression, like neck length. Trait expression is within genes and DNA and is heritable, passed from parent to offspring. Trait expression affects individual fitness and the likelihood that an individual survives and reproduces. I can't reach any leaves. I can reach some leaves. I can reach all the leaves. The most fit survive and reproduce. The least fit do not. Beneficial traits increase more often, while least beneficial traits decrease. Genetic changes ensure new trait expressions occur, and the process of natural selection repeats again and again. We can express natural selection mathematically and as an optimization problem. That is how to make something the best it can be. We can calculate and describe how to maximize the individual fitness of an organism through the variations in the genetic traits. Different expressions of the trait, long or short necks, can be thought of as potential solutions to our modeling problem. A population, all with different traits, represents many solutions. Using the fitness of each, asking, is it the best it can be, allows us to compare and judge. We can select the best solutions, combine or emphasize the finest parts of the strongest solutions, and we can create a new population of potential solutions. And like nature, we can repeat the math modeling again and again. So how might we apply such a natural selection process to creating a building? In architecture, diversity in form and function is goal-driven. For example, our goals might be to create an aesthetically pleasing, functional, sustainable net zero energy building at a reasonable cost. In designing our building, we have many variables, dimensions of length, width, and height, aspects and orientations of walls, north, east, south, and west, number, size, and location of windows, the ratio of window area to wall area, insulation, thickness of walls, construction methods, and more, efficiency rating of glass and windows, and roof thickness. Each of these variables influences the amount of heating and cooling needed to maintain a comfortable living temperature and low annual energy consumption. Other factors are cost to build and how desirable it is to live and work in the building. All these values influence how close we are to our goal to create an aesthetically pleasing, functional, sustainable net zero energy building at a reasonable cost. Architects and engineers use math models to describe how our different goals are influenced by building choices. Often, one choice favors one part of our goal over others. It is a challenge to meet all goals equally. Energy efficiency can be achieved by increasing insulation, driving heat loss and peak thermal load down, but building costs up. With so many variables and needs in our goal, math solutions are not enough. The Galapagos finches took generations upon generations in adapting. Using our math model of natural selection and the power of computers, we can simulate natural selection in seconds. Genetic algorithms are computer programs that are designed to imitate natural selection. These programs allow us to compare masses of alternate designs and select those that best achieve our goals. We can emphasize and combine design elements to produce new building variations, allowing us to replicate the many possible adaptations in natural selection process easily and quickly. We can apply natural selection design through genetic algorithms to a group of buildings, to a community. A well-designed building flourishes within a population. A community of well-designed buildings interact and influence the health of the entire population of buildings and so on. The more complex the design problem, the more that genetic algorithms can help us consider a variety of solutions. Computational thinking is much more than mathematics and computing. Requiring inspiration, creativity, and informed decision inspired by nature, it is ultimately rooted in design.
So we're going to be um, providing our statements uh, to these two provocations of um, how we came to be involved with an interdisciplinary OER and what did we find most thought-provoking about the process you experienced. Um, so I think, James, you're, you're starting that off a little bit. Sure. Yeah. Oops. Yeah. Uh, so I um, came to this uh, through um, uh, uh, trying to think of how, how best to explain this. So at the, at the time I was chair for the Center of Science or, yeah, and, um, and had been in discussions with PIMS and, and uh, Callisto around these, these ideas. Um, and so it was decided that we, we had this, this nugget of an idea and, and could we make, turn it into anything. Um, right away, I sort of wanted it to, to expand beyond just computational thinking in the traditional sense and knew that um, I wanted to take this sort of broader whole systems approach, but also right away knew I was in over my head uh, and, and needed more people to help. Um, and I think that's what I found most thought provoking about the experience was how do you take something um, like computational thinking move away from just teaching coding or uh, whatnot and and try and open it up to a broader audience and, and maybe hit students who haven't really thought about it in a way that would bring them in and actually find out that they, they're they interested and, and enjoy the topic. Um, and so that was my most sort of thought-provoking uh, intrigue, I guess, with this, this whole project. And so knowing that, um, I, I knew, like I said, that I needed more help. And so I broadcast it out. Um, and, and the first thing, being at AU, um, knowing that we have such great educators to work with um, and with such expertise in open education and whatnot, that's where I went. And so I was lucky enough that I, because to be quite honest, I didn't know who to contact. I just sort of broadcast like I'm interested in doing this and I was lucky enough that Connie responded so I'll pass it off to Connie now um, yeah and so I was very excited because I'm curious but a lot of time after a meeting I just go okay I'd say to my husband we're talking generative a not generative AI computational thinking I'm not a computer scientist I don't know what I'm doing with those people like it was it was very intimidating a lot of time but they were very welcoming and I always felt that um, my background in high school, teaching high school students in lots of different places, actually Northern Alberta, Northern British Columbia, and indigenous populations and, and places, um, also in rural Southern Alberta. I felt that I kind of understood to some degree the target audience, right? These high school students and how are you gonna catch their attention, hold it, and um, have something that's going to be able to allow them to enter into some really quite sophisticated thinking and yet not be overwhelmed. And, um, you know, the animation was always considered the jewel. There's a lot of, uh, Stella may talk a little bit more about some of the coding uh, lessons that were developed. but. Um, so that's how I came. I'm curious, I'm a learner, and I really think we need to work at breaking down those barriers between the silos. And um, a publisher probably would never create this. It would be like, no, that would be just like, we won't, you know, it's just way easier to stay in our lane, do our math resources, do our biology resources, do our computational thinking resources. And Callisto has been very um, interested about actually breaking down those barriers and they had a couple of presentations, maybe a couple of people attended that. But So that's how I came. It was through the invitation of James and then from that others joined. And so I'll pass the mic over to Trevor, who's on the telephone. Mm -hmm. Hey, Trevor, you're up, if you can hear. I'll give this a go. Thank you. Go ahead. Trevor? Oh. Hi, uh, can people hear me? Trevor, you're up, if yeah. you can hear. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, 
Yeah, so coming from, can you hear me okay? Just put your thumbs up, James, if you can hear me. Um, I'm going to talk right now. Um, so the, is it, am I coming through? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so from a um, engineering and architecture perspective, uh, we're used to working in quite big teams because we have the uh, client group, we have the owners, we have the, um, the, the maintenance crew, we have the builders, we have um, the architects, the engineers, the surveyors, the landscape people, we have the, the financiers, we have the city, the municipality, the neighbours, we, we have the utilities, there's lots of people in that team that we're used to working with. And sometimes, you know, it's, it's overwhelming. And so there is a tendency to stay in our silos because it can be overwhelming to know how to start the communication on design questions on how we could possibly reach a consensus on a solution that would be the right building for any given project. And uh, so that tends to lock people away and, and feel overwhelming. What, we, what we've done in the construction industry with architecture and engineering is to run what we call charrettes, which is a way of getting uh, an, like an interdisciplinary approach to design where we would typically have a facilitator to open up the conversation and to try and encourage people. We're all different personality types. Some are more confident talking in public. Others have got all the ideas but don't know quite how to communicate it. And sometimes you get the people with all the communication skills but no ideas. So it can be quite frustrating um, and it can lead to a lot of sort of dead ends on, on design ideas. So what we're trying to do with the charrette idea is to facilitate a conversation where we can open up uh, beyond the silos and bring all these ideas into a, into a, into a pot really uh, together. And so that's just my, my area, my background, but working with Connie, James and Stella, you know, on, on the, on the other areas of practice, the other areas of study, computer science, math, mm -hmm. education, uh, it really stretched, stretched us even further, stretched me further in that uh, experience when we were putting together this, this video and, and working together. Thanks, Trevor. Thanks. Okay. Um, so, I, when I joined the project, um, James and Connie had already made a start and I was brand new to AU, so I had this wonderful gift of a little bit of time because I wasn't embedded yet. Um, I had some project management background and I thought, oh, well, at the very least I can bring that. Um, but it turned out that actually I have um, a little bit of biology background from my own undergraduate degree, as well as um, genetic algorithm training and AI background too. So it turned out it was quite a good fit. And the time was an amazing gift that I could give. And we, what we did with this, I think, is we braid, managed to braid information together in a micro sense, in terms of looking at it from a different curricular points of view. And I really love the idea of joined up thinking, so I was very happy to join. One of the things I found most thought provoking was though that I did expect the different knowledge perspectives to come in. But what I didn't really expect was the diversity of people's processes from different disciplines. So it's interesting because uh, myself and James and Trevor are all in the, in the same faculty of science and technology, but we all have very different approaches to working with our students and our disciplines all work in a different way. And obviously Connie is from humanities and social science and, and education. And so practice education works in one way and humanities and social science works in another way and education and um, uh, academic area works in another different way. And so that sort of mix of process was one of the most interesting pieces for me. And I think we learned quite a lot in this. And in fact, Connie and I went off and 
and have done another video OER off the back of this experience and some of the things that we learned. So the diversity was very important. I think one of the other things that was really remarkable was when it's such a large diverse group, at the beginning we had a, a big influx. You saw our list of, of initial contributors. What we found was that although there was a lot of interest, there was very little engagement. And I think, you know, it comes to this time gift. People have to really be serious about whether they're going to be involved with an OER. And um, I also heard somebody speak earlier in the week that there is a good size for an OER when you're developing. Um, and the more people you have, the harder it is to keep them involved and keep them contributing. And they were recommending around a four or five. Well, we were very lucky because we two, had two RAs, one that was a practice educator and one that was a computer science person. So they did a lot of the work with us. So we were a team of six in essence. Um, and so that was quite a good, um, that was quite a good learning, was you need a lot of perspectives and to keep it open and find a funnel to accept ideas, but the core group needs to have sort of some motion. Um, the other thing is that the values that we set were really important f for the project and that I would encourage the idea to set values. So. Once we had done that, even our production company who made the video bought into the values that we had set. So the values were openness, collaboration and cooperation and empowerment. And the empowerment piece was very important and the, in that it was not just about bringing your own cooperation, but it was empowering others. So we had a lot of yes and conversations and a lot of conversations around, well, you know, what do you think from that point of view? If you had that problem, what would you do in your process, in your domain? So the, there's a lot more to the interdisciplinarity of it than just different knowledge bases. Mm -hmm. um, and the team values helped guide us pull together. The other thing was we also tried to keep our audience in sight at the whole time, which is a tenant of good communication, but it's something that needs not get lost in this sort of big mix of, of what there is. Now, one of the major, we're going to move on to some provocations here, but one of the major reflections about this is creating an OER like this is actually really quite expensive. So you've got a group of people involved, you've got a big group contributing, but you've got a, a, a core group. And so one of the things that I think we do in today's society is we look to reduce the cost of producing something. But in a way, and with this project and the other project, what we did was we tried to lean into, if it's going to cost that much to make a quality um, resource, what we need to do is make a resource that is of substantial quality that it is sustainable and it will move forward. So um, in, in this and the other project that we did, the videos act as an anchor or, you know, they, they provide that sort of basis from which you can hang other very specific OERs. They have a, a breadth of knowledge across them which allows you to um, link up different ideas. And so there is, if you find funding, it's worth leaning into an anchoring resource, knowing that you can then put other pieces with it as you go along and find other resources that you want to link to it. And I think that sort of connectedness is, is important. So this drives us to our sort of first question that we then came up with is if we're going to do have these deeper complex quality resources, what, what do they now allow us to do? If we create something that has got more depth, more hooks, how do we need to think differently about education and the resources that educators use? So Cable Green spoke about embracing open as a future mechanism to challenge pay systems. This would be one way to help bring those resources that are truly open together. Um, and a number of speakers have talked about the value in creating OER as an investment, like not just 
creating it as a cost, but thinking and reframing it and creating it as an investment. So if we were take, to take that frame of reference that this is an investment, what else could we do with these resources that we haven't previously been able to do? So I don't know whether Connie or James or, well, probably not Trevor because it's a bit complicated, but whether either of you have got some thoughts on that provocation question that you'd like to chip in? Well, I think, you know, as a program co-chair, we've been working very hard throughout in trying to bring together all the different keynotes, but also through the presentations, the action labs, etc. There's been many people saying in different ways, um, how do we, well, to use uh, Kayla Larson's um, image there of um, hand back, hand forward, I think was the order of it. So kind of using the, some of the strengths from the history the, you know, of where we're at in open ed and OER, but also kind of, again, looking forward. Because some of these issues that we're facing really require probably some different ways of perspective taking on these problems and helping people come into them in different ways so that they don't feel like that's only for the scientists to solve or that's only for the philosophers to solve or that's only for, um, you know, or I might not, maybe I don't have a lot of education and so I feel like I can't contribute to anything because I don't understand so much. And so in a way, having things that are open and accessible, I think that it helps people recognize that at certain places, um, people are interested and curious about things. And you can, you cannot anticipate or really ever really know for sure who your true target or audience is. So I think you design to be best for who you think, but Anticipate that there may be some learners, somebody curious, maybe, you know, somebody who's 70 could watch our video and learn something, right? So it's not that it's only for high school students. Um, and I think that's also the power of the animation, is that it's colorful, it moves along, there's the narrative. And I always felt that w there, and the animation company would tell us too, okay, you know, they had their little rules as well, and it was like four minutes. That's the, you know, like three and a half, four minutes. That's, that's really how long you want an animation to be. And it was like, well, we can't, I mean, I guess we could have three or four, th four three or four minute animations, but we packed it all in there. Like, and as a teacher, you could access it differently. Like, it's not just press play and watch it all the, th all the way through once, right? You could watch one clip and just, like that, that actually, I could teach that animation for a whole semester probably, and you would just sort of dive in deeper into different parts. But so it's sometimes thinking about, like I say, hand back and hand forward. How can we take what we know that's working from the past, but also start to think differently about how do we pull together some systems thinking? Because there is not a lot of systems thinking in um, K to 12 education, especially, but also in higher ed. You have it in certain programs, and then that's it. It's like there's only systems thinking for some people, but not for everybody. So that's what I think, is we could think differently about education. I could go on, but I'm going to pass the mic. <clears throat> yeah, I think for me, um, you know, it comes back to those ideas around whole systems and, and systems thinking. Um, and, and the idea of when we teach of breaking down those silos, showing that there are connections between all these um, different fields of study that we engage in. Um, and this, I think, you know, coming from my background, so I, I'm a mathematician and I, I'm a mathematical modeler, but um, my origins were actually in biology. Um, that's where I started as an undergraduate. And I had zero appreciation for mathematics until <laughs> probably th my third or fourth year um, as an undergraduate student in which I 
came to natural selection and started seeing models of natural selection and how they were used in, in biology. And then suddenly I was like, oh, math does have value. It does have a reason. Um, and that caused me to, to move into graduate studies in mathematics. Um, and, and from there, as you sort of branch out, you see more and more application and more and more connections. So I've worked in health research and um, health services and um, various ways. And so I'm very, because of my background and my story, I, I think I'm sort of really in tune with the fact that right away in our education system, we can create barriers and, and push people out of, of knowledge areas um, simply because of the way we teach certain things. And mathematics is really one of those fields for sure. It's very algorithmic. It's, you know, you get it right or you get it wrong. There's not a lot of discussion about the beauty of it or the meaning of it or its applications. Um, and so for me, it's, I think there's this real value in looking at how what we learn is connected. And the challenge of that, though, is that all of our resources and all of the way that we design curriculums is very siloed. We learn biology, we learn physics, we learn chemistry. Way over here, we learn social studies. They're not connected. But are they connected? Well, maybe they are. Um, <laughs> well, so, so one of the things, like when I look at this project, there's the connections between subjects and there's how you would scale it up and down um, and how you could even broaden the connection. So to use this as an example, we really focused on the natural sciences um, and connected it to this building or this problem of sustainable design. Uh, but sustainable design is connected to a lot of other problems, and we could have breached out into the social sciences. And, and, there are and when I talked about the rich curriculum connections to the high school curriculum, I think there's the potential to do that as well. So if you think about sustainable design, well, then you, you bring in all of the human elements to housing as a right. Um, the need for affordable housing and the um, and the value of affordable housing in all communities. What does that bring forward? Uh, the implications um, for health um, and population health. And when you start bringing in those uh, questions, well, we can start talking about policy design. So we come back to this idea of design. And when you start talking about policy design, then you start talking about analysis again, and you come back full circle to computational thinking and um, modeling and simulation. And, and these are all things that are being done. Um, and so we can, we can make these, we can always make these connections between the different subject matters. Uh, I, I think they're there. They're, when we deal with systems as complex as human systems, those connections are there. Um, so going back to the idea of scaling, these you get into some pretty complex ideas pretty quickly. Um, and so one of the things I think we need to think about um, with, in terms of education and, and the resources we create are also how those resources will scale up and they'll scale down. So we created a video that we thought, you know, sort of hit that high school target audience. Um, but I think, you know, could I use this in my undergraduate courses? I think absolutely, sort of. The video is intended to create sort of an overarching narrative. Um, but if I'm teaching a course on mathematical modeling, I think this video could serve as sort of the basis for that. And then, you know, there's all these different connections that we can go in and talk about. And if we're going to do mathematical modeling, well, what are the different problems that we could look at and how are we going to solve it using um, methods such as, uh, you know, adaptive dynamic methods like uh, genetic alg algorithms. Um, so I guess, you know, the danger of these panels is that you start rambling on, which I feel like maybe I'm doing. <laughs> but to summarize, I, I think one thing I'd like to really see with the change in how educational resources are created is that they get smaller in their size um, in terms of pieces of information so that they can be pieced together 
uh, as in multiple different ways uh, easily by, by essentially creators uh, who are the educators who want to teach in different ways or teach about whole systems or maybe you just want to teach about biology but then you can just grab all the biology pieces. Uh, but maybe you want to do something bigger and you can grab all these other pieces. And so that's a shift I think would really have value. Uh, Connie, you know, sort of alluded to Lego and I think that's an approach that, that has great value. Do we want to try and give Trevor uh, well, yeah. So um, James has, in his, uh, in his rambling, <laughs> sorry, not rambling though, has moved on to the second provocation, which is, if can we expand OER into spaces that are new yet needed? So areas that we haven't. <laughs> so um, I yes, Trevor, there's an opportunity for you to add in here if you would like. All right. Trevor, if you're there, we're going to give you a chance to, to speak to the second provocation here. And I'll give you the thumbs up to indicate that we can hear you. So, um, I, yeah, okay. Trevor, there's an opportunity for you to add in here if you would like. Thank you, Stella. Um, I hope you can hear me. Um, uh, so, you know, the one of the things when we're expanding the OER here, um, I and I, I think as James and, and as, as a, and Connie and you, you, you guys have said, it was about expanding typically what we are normally comfortable doing. And so when when I was invited to be part of the team, um, I my impression with an engineering background was let's come up with a formula or an equation. <laughs> that will solve this problem just by clicking a button and we'll be able to produce a great design tool that satisfies learning objectives, the math and the computing, as well as sort of the, the building design. And I found was that I met Connie, who was strongly advising on the educational side, um, which made me think more about, it's not just coming up with a solution, about how do we actually enable the learners reach their own solutions? How do we empower them to find solutions to this complex problem that we were trying to solve from a math and computer science point of view? And um, that was a real challenge because my brain had to, had to get out of its silo and take a walk over to the classroom or the online learning platform and find a way to communicate what were the um, what were the, the the Lego blocks? What were the components of the of the problem that we were trying to work with to, to reach a solution? And so there was a lot of unpacking with that. And then, as James talked about Darwin's finches on the Galapagos Islands, you know that that took me to a place again where I wasn't I'd, I'd never really looked at, wasn't really comfortable going there. But um, you know, we we sort of had to look at look at this from another perspective. And, um, you know, it, 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 it was a real challenge, but I think, and, and each time I've met with the three of the three of those lovely people in front of you today, um, it's, it's required me to think beyond where I normally spend most of my time. And it's about expanding, I think, thought, my own personal thoughts into coming up with this tool that, that can be useful for other people. And the more, you know, the more that I'm involved in education through Athabasca University and, and also in practice, you know, working with, with people who want new buildings, I, I'm starting to learn that there are, there, are, there are perspectives that people have that I just don't know about right now. I have no idea what they're, what's important to them. And I'm never going to know that unless I'm able to ask the question and, and, and pause and find a way to try and bring those into this discussion. I'm thinking especially, you know, about um, neurodiversity and different different needs that, that people have, uh, which um, can influence projects in a much more positive way because uh, there are different perspectives that we need to think about and get away from traditional styles of design or or ways of thinking about solving a problem. And I think, 
you know, there's a, there's, it can seem overwhelming sometimes to develop a open educational resource to do this. But I think as a team, and, and those three people, like Connie, James, and Stella, sat there right in the room with you right now, uh, you know, get together with a, with a team of people. Uh, we've, we've sort of shared our, our struggles and things we're not comfortable with together. And thankfully, they've, you know, as a, as a group, we've been able to support each other and, and work together and listen and understand and, and, and kind of come up with, with some plans uh, together. It's, it's a much stronger tool that, that we produced than if it had just been down to, to me or one of us on our own. So that's where this interdisciplinary working together is so important as a as a way to move education forward and you know everybody's got individual learning needs everyone's got things that they adapt to much easier than others and so everyone's got things that they struggle with and i think the more that we were able to work together the the stronger we are able to to come up with this this learning resource so um i think i think that's that's me rambling on for a little bit now <laughs> i'm gonna pass back <laughs> Thanks, Trevor. So, um, for me, um, just building off what James and Trevor have said, I think one of the things that we managed to do um, in this resource, um, to some extent, accidentally, is to realize how valuable the hooks are. So, within the piece that you create, you can leave deliberate hooks for other people to hang content from. Mm -hmm. And so there's a structure there that's easier to engage with in terms of a, a remix or a reuse or an addition to what, what is there for reuse. Um, and, uh, you know, the, they, um, I'm trying to think of what hasn't been said. And so, so that allows for different perspectives to be added to the overarching resource. So it's either an anchor or it's a springboard or it's a story tell. But it, what it does is provide that openness to get people initially engaged. And then it allows the educator to choose where they want to put their focus and how deep they want to go. So it's an incredibly flexible resource in, in following what James said about the pieces that can be added can be smaller. If you're very conscious about how you make the initial piece and it doesn't have to be a video it could be something else but the hooks that you put in it and the possibility of of placing things within there so for instance in this one we had a jupiter notebook with our wonderful ra liliana created a genetic algorithm and students could go in and alter values within that and understand how the parameters worked in running a genetic algorithm they could code one themselves if they wanted. But I also saw colleagues' eyes glaze over and absolute horror come when I said, well, you know, there's the code is there, you just press go, and they're like, well, which button is that? And so what I did was for students who are computer phobic in the sense of gubbins computering, not, you know, Instagram, um, I created a game that you could play, like a physical game where you are the genetic algorithm and the people in the class are given a parameter about how they move, you know, and, and, and they, you act out and you move across the room and, and satisfy the conditions for the, for getting the correct chromosome to, to come up. And so you can make the hook one hook serve multiple purposes for different learners at different levels or with different neurodiversity. And then you can also pin it onto other policy that's out there. So the UN SDGs, you can relate those to what you've got in there and hook those on. So you can connect out to existing platforms. And so uh, I think by thinking of the investment in that first OER piece as an investment and f as a frame for hanging other OERs from, it allows it to um, be uh, way more useful, way more flexible, and familiarity of one piece then bre brings more use of, of uh, pieces. I think um, 
Just touching on redistribution, I think this is one of the areas that we struggled with most. Um, in, we made it open, so that's fine. We have it on two places, that's fine. At a macro level, that's actually hard. Like, how do we get this to the right audience? How do we make people available uh, and aware that it's there? But for the future, I also think there's a micro level of redistribution that doesn't really happen. And what, what's going on there is that, that we need people who are using OERs to recommend OERs and we need to get educators talking to other educators about, oh, well, here's this good value overarching piece that you could maybe apply there. So for the K-12 to curriculum, it's obvious to see we're sil breaking down silos to solve big real-world problems in a context that students can engage with. But that micro-level redistribution, I think, is also really important for the future of OERs to breed sort of familiarity and break down those barriers of just not knowing how to use them effectively and in a, in a timely way. Um, so, I, I'm not sure that we really need a sum up. No, I think we're probably pretty good. Um, Maybe just move to that one. Yeah. I wanted to just mention you saw the QR code in OG, OEG Connect. There's a conversation going on about our interdisciplinary project. So if you're interested, there was someone from England who shared her PhD th thesis in interdisciplinary and systems thinking. So um, we did try to tie in to um, OEG Connect as well. So just, you know, this idea that it's very complex. It's, there's many moving parts. But really, if I had to say one thing, just go out there and try. Like, risk it. And, and um, Callisto wanted, that was one of their requirements, was that whatever was created would be openly licensed. But when sometimes when there's calls for all sorts of projects, like the second one, the follow-up that uh, Stella and I did, um, that was through the, um, the Canadian funding from the uh, funding from the uh, tri tri agencies here in, in Canada. But there was no requirement from the government to say that it had to be openly licensed. But there, they also said, you know, you can't. So we just. You know, if it's if it's something that you're applying for, make it open, even if they don't really ask for it to be open, right? And that's something that can be negotiated. And so I think um, we are going to uh, contact uh, Cable Green and the organizations that he was listing because sometimes too, when you're innovating, you can be actually ahead of of when, like you can like innovation sometimes occurs before it's really ready, right? Like, uh, so when you're um, ahead of the curve, I'm not saying that this is necessarily the case with our project, but at a certain level, I believe it is true. That in some ways, certainly our approach and the topic and trying to bring things together is um, sometimes a little bit of he ahead of when it's really going to be taken up or noticed. And that an OER can live out for a long time and in other words, risk it, try, have some fun, because we did. We had a lot of fun. You know, when we even talked about the panel, I said, "Oh, the the band's back together," <laughs> <laughs> and we had lots of fun. And that's you know, like we we. It's like we don't want to talk about that, but it's it's really an important part. It, it's part of the reinforcement of the good work that we're trying to do and share out. So I know everyone's tired, ready for a nice lunch, and I just thank you all for coming today. <laughs>